You can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you too, awesome. The bells are ringing here. Okay, oh, they are, of course they are. We're on our campus. Okay. I don't know if you can hear them in the background. I can hear them, okay. Yeah, a picturesque touch. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Awesome. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Women, Men, and Food webinar. It is a webinar co-sponsored by the Yale Food and Beverage Group, Yale Women, and shared interest groups at the Yale Alumni Association. Our guest today is Professor Paul Friedman of the Yale Department of History. My name is Wendy Maldonado. I'm a member of the Yale Class of 1993 and a member of the Yale Alumni Association Board of Governors. I manage the Yale Food and Beverage Group on Facebook with support from Kevin Winston, my fellow member of the Board of Governors. I would like to thank you for taking time out of your day to join us today. Before I introduce Professor Friedman, I just wanna mention a few items of housekeeping. Uh, on this webinar, everybody is on mute except for Professor, Professor Friedman and myself. You will see a chat button. You also see a Q&A box uh, on the bottom of the screen right next to the little participants icon. If you have any questions for Professor Friedman, please pose them in that box and I will be fielding them. This session is being recorded and will be shared with you after the webinar within a few days and later it will be posted to the Yale Alumni um, Association website. Professor Friedman will be speaking for about 20 minutes on the topic and has uh, graciously agreed to leave the rest of the time in the webinar to answer all of your questions. So just as way of introduction, we started the Yale Food and Beverage Group after noting that both Yale students and alumni were intensely interested in food, food and beverages. I personally am a child of the 70s who grew up on fish sticks and boxed macaroni and cheese and cherry jello. And fortunately today I eat much better than that. Professor Paul Friedman of Yale's Department of History is here to share some of his deep knowledge on food history with us today. Professor Friedman specializes in medieval social history, the history of Catalonia, comparative studies of the peasantry, trade and luxury products, and the history of cuisine. He is the author of 10 Restaurants That Changed America, and his upcoming book, which will come out later this year, is American Cuisine and How It Got This Way. So, Professor Friedman, uh, you graciously off, um, shared some excerpts from your upcoming book with me, and in that one chapter, you discuss the perceptions of food preferences and how women and men are assumed to have different tastes now. For example, women are thought to prefer sweets, and dainty and light foods, while men are sought to prefer heartier meals. Can you talk a little bit about where this belief originated? Yes, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning into this. Um, I should say before I begin that uh, one of the chapters of this forthcoming book is entitled The Magical 1970s. So, um, Wendy, that is dedicated to you and to your cohort. So what I thought I would talk about today um, is based on a chapter in this book on men, women, and food. And it's really um, mostly on when was it decided that women have particular food preferences. Uh, as Wendy said, the idea that women like sweet dishes or sugar is old, also very old, and by old I mean medieval and before, is the notion that in pregnancy women have odd uh, desires for food. But beyond this, um, the notion that, for example, women particularly like salad or quinoa or tiramisu didn't just spring up spontaneously and also it wasn't always in existence. What created the notion that women like certain different things is less biology in my opinion, and more culture. And that culture includes things like dietary advice from experts, as well as so-called experts, uh, corporate advertising, magazine articles, all of which created a division between male and female tastes beginning over a century ago, really after the Civil War even. And this difference between what men and women like has been the object of angst, humor, selfishness, and self-sacrifice. And that's what I hope to talk about in the next 
20 minutes. Before the Civil War, one has the impression that the whole family ate the same things together, more or less contentedly. At least this is what is portrayed in books of household management and uh, cookery, which are very numerous in the early 19th century. Bestsellers, uh, manuals for women running a home on how to cook, but also you know how to get rid of vermin, how to wash clothes, all sorts of forms of home management. And in none of these is there any hint that men like different food than women. Um, basically, uh, uh, women cook food, men eat it, women eat it, children eat it, and uh, uh, there's no, it's not just that there's no sense of indulging special interests, but the, these special interests don't seem to exist. Um, menus from women's restaurants, and these women's restaurants before the Civil War were spaces set aside for women unescorted by men. Uh, the menus from these restaurants are the same as the menus from the uh, uh, male restaurants, the gentlemen's ordinaries, as they were called. So the women's ordinaries menus have things like uh, organ meat, pig's feet, calf's head, roast meat, turtles, not what later generations would consider to be female-oriented food. Beginning in the 1870s, which is about the time when customs of society allowed women to dine without men as escorts. They could dine in the company of female friends or co-workers or alone. Special menus for ladies' lunches start to feature things like salads, cold chicken, pastry shells with cream sauces, what at that time were considered to be light foods. So part of the audience or the, the, the patrons of these restaurants were really two kinds of women, uh, a middle or upper middle class cohort that did not work but were shopping downtown, often with friends and needed some place to have lunch, or uh, office workers of a more lower middle class to middle class um, rank who needed some place to have lunch. So lunch is the first real women's meal. And these ladies' lunches um, now, you know, you don't return home for your lunch, you take it out. And these were uh, offered by what I would call genteel establishments. And genteel means not only nicely decorated rather than the rough and tumble wooden sawdust on the floor look of bars for men, um, and safe, uh, uh, places where women uh, would uh, uh, be free from cursing, drinking on the part of men, uh, generally rowdy or sub-rowdy behavior. So restaurants like Schraff's in the Northeast, which I uh, describe a little bit in 10 Restaurants That Changed America, are examples of these female-friendly place. Tea shops, which were very common department store restaurants. All these created safe spaces for women, places uh, without alcohol, and uh, generally speaking, women outnumbered men. Men were prohibited from that, but men tended to seek out places that were more, uh, um, more to their tastes. But even more significant, I think, than the gracious setting and the real innovation of places like Shraft was providing food that was thought to be that which women liked. And what women like from 1890 or so to the present is supposed to be light entrees and very elaborate sweet desserts, like ice cream or cake or both. So from 1900 to 1930, the term for this kind of cuisine that's most often used is dainty. Dainty means fanciful but not filling food. So typical female words describing food um, uh, are uh, decorous, colorful, light, imaginative. And here we're talking about salads, things with jello, um, 
anything decorated with marshmallows or maraschino cherries, uh, whipped cream is a must. Some things that were originally identified as female, like tuna fish salad sandwiches, later became mainstream. Others like cottage cheese and fruit or multicolored jello desserts remained what might be called gendered female. There are self-appointed advocates for men who complain in the early 20th century that women were inordinately fond of bland but decorative food. The authors of a burgeoning cookbook genre directed to men claim that women don't actually like food, depicting women as somehow accomplices in the decline of American food. Women were blamed for embracing modern conveniences such as canned meat or vegetables or industrial produced bread or later on cream of mushroom, condensed cream of mushroom soup or um, uh, uh, again, jello or uh, um, any artificial or processed or ersatz food. What men are supposed to like are spicy and hearty dishes. So, for example, in 1934, a writer for the magazine House and Garden scolded wives for serving men fruit salads or what he called bits of fluff like marshmallow date whip. They should keep their dainties, the word that he used, for ladies' lunches and serve their husbands things like goulash, chili, or corned beef hash with poached eggs on top. <coughs> so <coughs> in the 20th century, in beginning really with the turn of the century, there was a proliferation of cookbooks telling women to give up their gendered preferences in order to please their boyfriends or husbands. One of the most successful books, which um, uh, some alumni uh, may uh, certainly remember, is The Settlement Cookbook, subtitled The Way to a Man's Heart. And it was first published in 1903 and reprinted many times thereafter. But there are other books uh, with titles like A Thousand Ways to Please a Husband from 1917, or simply Feed the Brute from 1925 all based on the premise that if women failed to satisfy their husband's appetites, their husbands would stray. And this panic was amazingly widespread. A woman wrote to General Mills fictional spokesperson, Betty, Qua Betty Crocker, expressing the fear that her neighbor was going to, quote, capture her husband because she made, the neighbor made fudge cake while the writer was partial to vanilla cake. However eager men might be for food with gusto and flavor, in the 20th century, they didn't really want their wives to be single-mindedly devoted to the kitchen. As Frank Shattuck, the founder of Schrafts, observed in the 1920s, a young man contemplating marriage is looking for a girl who's a good sport. He doesn't set a priority on domestic tasks, even cooking. A husband doesn't want to come home to a bedraggled wife who is slaved all day at the stove. He wants to eat his cake, literally, uh, um, and, uh, but with an attractive and fun companion. So there's this somewhat uh, uh, contradictory pressure on women to cook food that their husbands like, but not be too devoted to cooking so that that seems to be all they are doing. And food advertisers made money from both sides of this contradictory set of attitudes. Women must please their husband. Uh, one advertisement shows an irritated husband saying, mother never ran out of Kellogg's cornflakes. But also women had to avoid the appearance of drudgery. So uh, a brochure for a uh, cooking appliance company uh, shows a woman wearing pearls and a low cut dress, obviously ready to go out for the evening, opening the oven door to show her enchanted husband, also quite dressed up, uh, a pot ro um, roast beef and a bunch of other things uh, cooking in pots. So she has everything set. They're gonna have a, a nourishing plus meal, but she's so far from being frazzled that for some reason she's already got her uh, pearls on. So convenience products, though, were really suited to resolve this contradiction between the woman as good cook and the woman as non-frazzled companion. 
some typical convenience foods, which some people remember better than others. Fish sticks, canned fruit cocktail, Miracle Whip, that is artificial mayonnaise, Cool Whip, artificial whipped cream, TV dinners, the ancestor of microwavable things like lean cuisine, cheese wigs, cheese whiz, which is like cheddar cheese in a canister, Kool-Aid, cake mixes, frozen biscuits. I mean, obviously we could go on for the rest of the time. But the epitome of convenience products at their zenith is a 1951 cookbook by Poppy Cannon called the Can Opener Cookbook. And this promised gourmet cuisine prepared with just a few turns of the can opener or twists of the jar top. The mighty can opener, Poppy Cannon crowed, was the equal of the French chef's knives, pots, training, and, uh, and effort. If convenience meant that food was bland because the ingredients are processed, the solution was to dress them up, but not with marshmallows or other dainty touches, but in the form of creative food. Creative food, as the term is used in the 1950s to 70s, is food that no one has ever seen before. Um, so for example, a 1963 recipe put out by Minute Rice was called chicken a la can can, because it included cans of condensed chicken soup, cream of celery soup, French fried onion rings, uh, along with the rice, which was Minute Rice, of course. The, the maker of Minute Rice, even though uh, they gave it this hokey name, claimed the dish is French, fancy, and flavor-filled. So they're advancing a quasi-gourmet claim, along with its ease of preparation and its heartiness. Your husband will love this. So the post-war era of casseroles, Ambrosia, which for those who don't know, is a fruit and coconut salad. Salads generally, jello desserts. This is when creative cooking reached its height, if that's the right word for it. Beginning in the 1970s, how families dined changed dramatically. Increasing amounts of time were spent in restaurants, including fast food establishments. And family dinners tended to be superseded by different sorts of meals at different hours for different members of the family. Women worked outside the home in increasing numbers and this affected meals without necessarily inducing men to take on household responsibilities. The microwave oven first diffused in the 1970s increased meal options and encouraged alternatives to sit down dinners. The women's movement destroyed ladylike places like Schraft's, and it also undermined the image of the happy housewife preparing her casseroles or chicken yum yum for her doting husband. <laughs> With all these social changes, the image of women's tastes has remained surprisingly consistent. Differences are not dead. Kale, quinoa, and other vegetarian or health-related fads are still gendered female, as are Chardonnay and Rosé wines, while barbecue and bourbon are male. This is not fixed. So not long ago, a New York Times article noted that a young woman on a first date dinner now often orders steak to show that her taste in food is the same as that of the guy. Not, but not exactly that her taste is the same, but to signal that she's not a picky eater, obsessed by health or diet. The guy doesn't really care what she likes to eat or not. What he's worried about on the first date is that she's gonna tell him to change his diet, that she's gonna chivvy him about the unhealthful way he's eating. So ordering steak is a kind of reassurance to the guy. Well, a lot of this is being upended by social change generally, the hashtag Me Too movement in particular. Suddenly the macho chef image is suspect, uh, as is what uh, chef Amanda Cullen of the New York restaurant Dirt Candy calls the vegetables are for girls assumption. But I think it's gonna take a lot to get rid of male and female stereotypes about food, even if they're not ingrained biologically, ideas about male versus female food are firmly entrenched. And while they're gonna be transformed, I'm not sure they're likely to fade away. 
So that's my presentation. Uh, as Wendy said, I'm really eager to hear uh, uh, comments and um, question and answers. Wonderful. Um, ah, so we have our first question, and you guys, this is this is your chance to to ask all anything you want to a Professor Friedman. He's ours until two o'clock. So our first question is from Nancy Edwards. I'm assuming she wants to know: Do you find the same? Uh, difference and uh, perceived differences in, in for drinks between men and women. I know that, that when my husband and I order an absinthe and a rosé in France, 100% uh, of the time they give the absinthe to him and the wine to me. Yes, yes. I'd say that the drinks are a little newer. Uh, I mean, always uh, in, in pubs in England, uh, uh, in Britain, for example, Women might have Guinness, oddly enough, but bitter was always a male drink. So uh, Shandy, which is a mixture of ginger beer and uh, uh, beer, uh, uh, was always a, a women's drink. Uh, when cocktails first started to come in in the 1950s, there was a sort of grumbling on the part of men that, you know, uh, anybody who ordered a vodka tonic or something like that was either a woman or not a real man. So yeah, these are all, but the rosé uh, absinthe pairing, I'd say is, is newer, particularly the white wine and women idea. Uh, I'd say we, again, the 1970s is key. Okay. Um, so I have a question from Tiffany Petrosino. Do you think gender differences start at a young age? And do young boys eat differently than young girls? What have you observed? Um, I am not sure of this. I think so, but I'd say that for a long while, it is um, just age rather than gender. And the age business is changing. So um, 20 years ago still, and, and, be, and before that, uh, the problem for parents was often that their kids only would eat at McDonald's. Uh, they only liked crappy food uh, and that somehow there, there was some sort of gene that fortunately faded away, but it took maybe uh, 20 years to fade away that uh, 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 made kids uh, love that. But just the other day, someone was telling me uh, uh, that, that her eight-year-old daughter now talks about the plating of stuff at restaurants, is much more interested in food than uh, 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 the mother. And you know, where did she get this? Uh, she probably got it from the Food, Chat, food Network or some other uh, food-related uh, uh, media item or, or uh, you know, her, her, uh, <laughs> her group, uh, her alumni group on food. So um, uh, I'd say that the differences are visible, the vegetable versus meat, but also the, um, the somewhat more adventurous female choices, uh, or at least wider dossier of dishes, but that the real distinction is still, um, still age more than gender. Excellent. So I'm going to uh, grab a, a question or two from the chat. I'm going to be toggling back and forth, but I would ask participants to uh, route their questions to uh, the Q&A box rather than the chat. Um, so Kevin Winston is in Los Angeles, and he notes that there is actually a lot of gender equity and food in Los Angeles where both men and women seem to equally eat kale and quinoa and salads and fresh juices. So I guess my question to kind of follow up on, on Kevin's comment is, are you starting to see this trend um, away from gendered, uh, perceived gender preferences in food? Yes, to the extent that women uh, are the original owners of the health um, aspect of food, and men have historically tended to resist it. So some of this business in the early 20th century about lightness or save your fripperies for your ladies' lunches is really the sort of thing that in the 1970s classic, or maybe early 80s, was real men don't eat quiche. Mm -hmm. So um, that turns out not to be true, or real men uh, uh, is no longer a category. And so there's a way in which, to the extent that people care more about health, they're going to eat food that formerly was more gendered feminine. 
So it's not so much that the that it's more equitable as that the female opinion is um, is stronger or taking over the sort of general accepted practices. Interesting. Okay, and since you just mentioned that, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll get to your question in a minute, minute Thomas. Um, I have a question from Robin um, on this real men eat. Uh, question. Here's, here's what she says. Um, her name is Robin Say. She says, hello from a former student. With the rising trend of lab-grown meat, like the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat, how does that play into gender food stereotypes around masculine red meat and more feminine vegetarian food? In the short term, it means that uh, many men resist uh, Impossible Burger, etc. So uh, you see this in um, the same kinds of people who say that liberals are going to take straws away from us, uh, think that uh, hamburgers are going to be banned very soon, uh, you know, right after guns. So there's a rhetorical kind of um, power to uh, resistance to artificial or you know, plant-based uh, meat. In the longer term, I think it will uh, end some of these stereotypes. But I, I think, despite what I said about health, that women do not perceive themselves as loving meat but not eating it for reasons of health. They have perceived themselves in America uh, as not really liking meat all that much. Um, uh, particularly red meat. So, you know, for a while, chicken is okay uh, for some reason. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it's not sort of like, oh, if I had my way and if it was healthful, uh, I, I, I'd eat roast beef all the time. It's, it's more an aesthetic preference. Okay, thank you. All right, so Thomas Norberg asks, how do class issues intersect with the male-female divide regarding food choices? To the extent that people who are poor don't have a lot of choice, then they're not fussing about, um, uh, they're not able to uh, start to discriminate among foods that they're not gonna eat because they're unhealthful. Um, the difference between what men and women like, however, remains uh, remains pretty strong. It's just that the it's sort of the ability to fulfill it, so that a lot of poor people, unfortunately, may be eating food, uh, you know, like ramen and uh, and rice combinations that are that neither men nor women particularly like, but that's actually what they can afford. Okay, um, so just to. Uh talk a little bit more about that. Um, Stephanie Scarmo asks, how does food access play into gender stereotypes? Do you see differences between low income versus high income groups? You just mentioned that there might be a lot more limited um, variety of what poor people could access. Um, do you want to say anything more about that? Just so that I do, in case you wanted to follow up. Yeah, it. well, see, this may not be exactly answering the question, but the context is that um, the upper classes or people of uh, social reform temperament often, always, in fact, have assumed that the poor eat uh, a bad diet because somehow they're not educated or they, they, because they're ignorant. Um, generally speaking, 100 years ago and now, the poor eat an unhealthful diet because an unhealthful diet is the cheapest and they have trouble paying for food. So while the average American spends, I don't know, 14, 15% of their income on food, uh, it rises uh, uh, very dramatically for people at the poverty level. So um, of course that means that the ability to um, express what you like is less a subject of conversation and less prominent. That doesn't mean that people don't have personal preferences or that they don't have uh, uh, gendered preferences. It may mean that the concern with health is in a more basic way, like over sugar. 
uh, things that now are not subjects of conversation among upper middle class people because, you know, uh, sugar is either prohibited or only allowed as an indulgence, the sweet desserts, uh, the chocolate doesn't count school of thought. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Marissa Ayn. What do you foresee as the next food trend for preparing dinner at home and efforts to keep families together for mealtime? Do you think meal kits are going to decline or rise? Uh, I am very interested in this question and I wish I had an answer. It's a very central question because uh, particularly with young people, uh, so people in their 20s and early 30s who are spending a whole lot of money on restaurants, but who are also very concerned with health and personal autonomy. Personal autonomy meaning I like to know what's in my food or I like to know where, you know, who made my clothes, or I like to know uh, 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 how my utility is channeling the water that uh, is in my home. Um, sooner or later, logically, such people should start cooking at home more. Right at the moment, we spend more money on dining out uh, than um, uh, uh, eating at home. So uh, yes, uh, one way of getting people to eat at home, one way of controlling how much sodium you're getting or you know, how much fat uh, uh, you're getting is uh, meal kits that allow you to cook at home without uh, um, what is perceived as an insane amount of chopping and you know, preparation and then throwing the unused stuff out. The disadvantages so far of meal kits are um, after a while, the selection doesn't seem to be as great as it does in the beginning. They've got to appeal to a fairly wide range of people and then reliability. And you know, reliability is fixable up to an extent, but you, know, you don't get the meal kit on time or uh, you don't get the right meal kit or there's some deterioration of the ingredients. But assuming all that is fixable, um, my personal opinion is that it's not that hard to cook uh, and that um, we've been sort of victimized by the notion that somehow it's really, really challenging. But um, that's easy for me to say. I, I've, I've been cooking for better or worse for 40, 50 years. So, um, uh, now I do have an idea of how bad, how, how badly things can go wrong and sort of the maximum uh, of how well they can go right. Um, as a way of getting people to eat together, this is a big challenge, but to the extent that kids are becoming more food oriented and less just give me something to eat so I can go out to practice um, or just seeing food as a kind of uh, annoying uh, but nagging uh, need, uh, then yes, you can start to have you know, have families eat together uh, on food that the kids prepare. This is not unheard of, and to the extreme, as well, exploit that energy and, and put it to use. Excellent. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Deborah Steppel. She says, I believe much of a person's tastes are formed as infants, mothers who eat a varied diet and breastfeed raise babies and children with a varied palate, while the trend of formula fed infants created a generation of kids who prefer chemical tasting food like chicken nuggets and other processed foods. My understanding is purely anecdotal though. Have you seen any studies validating this? Uh, I haven't. Um, it, it sort of makes a certain amount of sense, but I would say that um, also factors are simply uh, how much money the family has, uh, what kinds of places kids are taken out uh, to eat, um, and uh, signals from the culture that the uh, parents don't completely control. So uh, again, while I don't think everything on food TV is great, it does offer a sense of adventure that was lacking, totally lacking before, and that makes um, kids interested in food as a form of self-expression or of different kinds of stimuli, rather than simply uh, 
uh, I need to eat because I'm hungry. I've had McDonald's cheeseburgers a million times before. That's what I want now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Nancy Edwards um, and Lulu asked uh, a question that they're, they're very similar, so I'm going to combine them. Um, Nancy Edwards would like to know if you've been able to look at this issue in immigrant communities or in housewife manuals. And Lulu's question is very similar. She says, America has been called a melting pot with the melding of a variety of ethnic cultures, for example, Chinese, Italian, Japanese, Mexican. What about ethnic foods and perceived gender differences and, and preference? Yeah, it's less, uh, certainly with first generation immigrants uh, because it's, um, it's there, but it's not really present in terms of the meals that are served. If whoever is responsible for making the meal, there's a sense of gratitude that they made the meal and not a great sense of other choices. Uh, the most influential aspect of immigrant households though, and this has been studied by uh, a, a brilliant uh, food scholar and sociologist named Krishnan Dure, um, who studied particularly, but not exclusively, Bengali immigrants in New York. The most influential thing is kids. Uh, the kids' experience in school tends to Americanize them. Uh, their uh, better command of English, uh, their familiarity with popular culture, uh, and uh, there's a certain amount of pressure that they exert, I'd say probably less now, than maybe 20 years ago when they'd be teased in school for bringing we what was regarded as weird food. I, I think we are in a much more, not just tolerant, but kind of, as I said, adventurous multiculturalism now. Uh, but still, uh, the two forces that press on immigrant families uh, towards directing them towards Americanization are one, unavailability of ingredients, and two, uh, their kids' preferences, their kids' being Americans more than uh, or as much as they are uh, uh, members of the home country group. Very interesting. Okay, I have a question from Nancy Alexander. She says, a meta question. In the 1970s, when Yale College was newly co-ed, women's senior essays on topics such as quilts and Barbie were rather controversial because they weren't considered scholarly. What has changed so that a domestic topic such as diet is considered acceptable scholarship? Uh, acceptable scholarship for a senior essay, but not necessarily um, acceptable scholarship, say, in the Department of History. So I'm able to do this uh, because I am keeping up my job as a medievalist. Uh, if I just suddenly announced that, you know, I'm no longer a medieval historian, I'm a food historian, um, I probably could still get away with it because I'm almost 70 years old. But, uh, you know, if I were younger, I, I, I might be uh, tried for heresy. <laughs> uh, food is a serious topic, but the serious part of it are things like famines. Nobody denies that you know, studying famines or diet you know what did the what did the average peasant eat in 16th century france that's a perfectly respectable topic and it was a respectable topic uh, 40 years ago when i got my phd um cuisine the choice of what people eat uh, a dissertation about restaurants or a dissertation about um uh, uh women's desserts in the early 20th century um it, it, it'd be okay, but it's not prima facie serious even now. Got it. Okay. I have a question from Jennifer Madar. What are your thoughts on the stereotypes of men owning the outdoor cooking, i.e. grilling, while women own the indoor, i.e. stovetop cooking? Yeah. Do you see that changing significantly anytime soon in the United States? Um, yeah, this is very perceptible in the 50s when that's the only realm uh, that mass culture assigns to men. And so President Eisenhower, for example, had a recipe for steak grilled right on the charcoal. Um, but you know, he doesn't have a casserole recipe as far as we know. Um, yeah, this is partly a atavistic survival of the traditional European notion that the work of men is out in the fields at some distance from the house. 
and the work of women is near the house. The work of women in the Middle Ages, certainly, and for many centuries after, was as vital as that of men economically in terms of subsistence. So the woman is brewing ale uh, or wine, depending on location. The woman is tending the garden, which is a major source of, uh, of nutrition. The woman is uh, responsible for the dairy cattle, for the chickens. Uh, so it, it, you know, domestic work in terms of space uh, uh, only later becomes identified with mere maintenance, you know, cleaning, mm -hmm. uh, cooking. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, outdoor, uh, outdoor cooking is male, and uh, that's going to remain so for a long time. What I didn't mention in my talk, uh, because I didn't want to kind of get into too many different things, but uh, an interesting area is cookbooks addressed to men. Uh, you know, rather than telling wives what to cook for their husbands, um, things like uh, Playboy and Esquire, men's magazines, uh, uh, issued cookbooks, which, whose basic premise was... Um, you can do it. You can make, you know, often addressed to bachelors too, to be sure. You can make food that you like, or you can make food to impress your female dates, or real men actually like more than uh, 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 steaks. So um, one of my favorites is a uh, cookbook called The Action Cookbook by the spy thriller writer Len Dayton. And its back, its front cover shows a uh, man cooking pasta. He's right by the stove and he's lifting the pasta out of the pot while a, um, a, a young woman is kind of hugging him from the back. Uh, and then the reverse is on the back cover. The woman is cooking and the man is hugging her on the back. But the message in both cases is, you know, food and love, food and sex. But, um, uh, it's not exactly egalitarian, but still there's the notion that men uh, can learn how to cook or men even, some of these assert that men have an instinctive love of cooking. Women, women cook out of drudgery and obligation, but men cook out of flair and creativity. Some of this is because, of course, such men's cooking as is being done is largely weekend cooking. And, you know, anybody, if they have time, uh, uh, can follow an elaborate recipe. The challenge is to put food on the table uh, every day. So many of these male cookbooks acknowledge that in terms of everyday cooking, this is, this is a job that men are completely incapable of, but um, still have this kind of uh, same version of the chili and uh, corned beef hash with poached eggs, except you make it. Got it. I have another question from Thomas Nordberg. Are males and females converting to vegetarianism and veganism in equal numbers? Not equal, but not all that far away. So one of the big developments of the last 20 years is that rather than veganism and vegetarianism being gendered pretty much exclusively female, what I said before, Owen's vegetables are for girls. Uh, there are lots of male vegans and vegetarians. And so uh, embracing of that movement is, uh, is, is, is pretty close to equal. Interesting. So I have a question for you. Um, from the excerpt of your book, you talked about the influence of magazines on, of, of the uh, 20th century on, the per, on these perceptions of male and female food preferences. And you devoted a significant amount of time to talking about Gourmet Magazine, which still exists today, as well as Good Housekeeping. No, alas, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't? No, oh no. Oh my God, how did I miss that? Food no, and it was uh, several years ago. Yeah. So if you, could you talk a little bit about uh, Gourmet's history in this area? I thought that was a really interesting story. Sure. So Gourmet was established in what would seem to be an unpropitious moment. Uh, it's either 1940 or 41. It's either just before the war, uh, American involvement in the war, or just after. Um, and was wildly popular, even, even up to uh, the time it was shut down which is a story that Ruth Reichel tells in her latest memoir. She was the last editor of Gourmet. It was a beloved magazine uh, and extremely important both in preserving uh, ideas about fine dining um, during the drought of the, you know, basically 1940s to late 70s. Um, uh, and also, in creating the sort of thing that, you know, your group 
represents uh, a nationwide group of people who are interested in food. You look at their letters columns, it's by no means dominated by East and West Coast. Uh, there are recipes submitted by or requested by people from all over, uh, uh, all, uh, literally all over the country. But when it was founded in the 1940s, up until the late 40s, it built itself as a magazine for men um, because it bought into the notion that women don't really like food, that women cook out of obligation, and that women are really the um, willing victims of the food industry and somehow like processed food. So that gourmet, on the one hand, anticipates a lot of our uh, desire for authenticity of ingredients, for seasonal ingredients, for quality rather than convenience. But it identified this with things like hunting. So uh, uh, their early covers often show uh, men fishing or, or uh, dead animals. Uh, I think their, maybe their second cover shows a boar's head uh, on a plate. Um, this is real food and real food or authentic food or flavorful food is, is male. Um, by the late 40s, it's amazing they stayed in existence because their subscribers were always, right from the start, predominantly female. Uh, with the appointment of Louis Diot, a French chef who was active in the United States and among other things, the inventor of Vichy Soise. With the appointment of Louis Diot, you can see a change in tone. So Diot talks about his mother and how much he learned from his mother and how much food is a kind of comfort, and how much food is an expression of love and family. Uh, and he sort of soft pedals the go out and uh, shoot some ducks and then, and then cook them yourself side of gourmet. Um, uh, gourmet had two features that I loved as a kid, and in going back over uh, early issues for this book, uh, I fell in love with again. One was called um, uh, uh, sugar and spice. And this was recipes volunteered by readers or letters really to gourmet that often said, oh, your magazine is the best thing uh, in my life. And uh, out of gratitude, I'm giving you my uh, secret recipe for coconut rum balls or, you know, uh, rhubarb Fitzpatrick. The person's name is Fitzpatrick. Uh, you asked for it was the reverse. You asked for it was, we had a meal at uh, the um, uh, London uh, Grill in Detroit and we fell in love with their uh, um, corn chowder. Could you possibly get the recipe for us? And they always did. I mean, if they didn't, the letter wasn't published. So uh, these are things that people want to get. What's interesting about the both recipe sections um, is that on the one hand, they're impoverished compared to today for ingredients. Like if you can get shallots, use them. If you can't, use onions. Uh, or there's this dish I've heard about in Korea that's some kind of pickled cabbage. I don't remember the name, but I think the first syllable is Kim. Could you possibly get a recipe? Um, or baba ganoush is another thing that, you know, just like, I've heard of this, uh, uh, does it really exist? Or I had it in Lebanon, but I can't quite remember the name. But on the other hand, they're very sophisticated about uh, how to cook. They, if, 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 if you have to roll out pastry dough, they just say roll out pastry dough. They don't include a section on how to make pastry dough. So that's a rather long-winded answer, but yes, uh, a gourmet is absolutely fascinating and absolutely fundamental to American culinary history. Um, another question uh, I had was around female chefs and female restaurateurs. Like, uh, you know, you think of restaurants like Mama Leone's or Sylvia's or, um, you know, Alice Waters' movement toward locally produced food or, um, you know, some of the celebrity female chefs we find today. Do you think that those women did and are changing stereotypes around food preferences and gender. Um, what role do you see those women having played then 
as well as how, how they, that's, that continues to play into the evolution of gender and food preferences. Yeah, yeah. So um, of the 10 restaurants that were in my book, uh, four of them were created by women. The ones that you mentioned, uh, Chez Panisse, Alice Waters, Sylvia's, Sylvia Wood, um, uh, the um, Mama Leone's, uh, the Mandarin is the other one uh, that Cecilia Chang created, a Chinese restaurant. Uh, and that was coincidence. I didn't sort of set out uh, to uh, have a certain number of female founded restaurants. And um, they were all chefs, that is, they all cooked the food. But I would say that up until very recently, the home cook was gendered female and the restaurant cook was male. So uh, the major effect of changes that are recent, like the Me Too movement, is that it's kind of killed the bad boy male, lovable but bad boy chef image. Um, so bad boy still, but um, you know, uh, uh, somehow this is less endearing than it was just a few years ago. How that's gonna play out, I don't know, because um, male chef as nice person, male chef as caring, uh, okay, you know, Rene <laughs> was at me, maybe. <laughs> Massimo Bottura, you know, I can name some, but not many. Yeah. And um, uh, so I think women own that space. And I think, I think there is a, uh, a, a shift, but it's a very recent one. It's amazing how long not only the chef as male lasted, but how male, you know, how changeable it was. You could go from the uh, French arrogant Paul Bocuse bottle to the, um, uh, uh, you know, Mario Batali model. Uh, and while the level of formality changes, the level of maleness and of sheer um, ability or will to impose your uh, self did not. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just as a side note, I've worked as a waitress in restaurants and I've always observed that the, the cooks tend to be overwhelmingly male um, who are working the lines and uh, women tend to be working the other lines, but that, that's a whole other subject of conversation. Um, we have time for two uh, last questions before we have to roll off here. Thomas Norberg asks, Dear Professor, do the trends regarding male female preferences you describe so masterfully apply in a similar fashion to gourmet dining? Uh, they did. So, um, you know, there were restaurants in the, I actually went to one uh, in San Francisco as a college student where even though uh, my college friend and I were much younger than his mother and her friend who took us out, we got the menus with the prices um, because we were male. So there's some of that. Um, uh, who gets the wine list? Uh, who tastes the wine. Uh, this has certainly changed uh, uh, towards a more egalitarian model. But yes, it was always assumed that men uh, were both more knowledgeable and uh, were going to order food on the basis of taste and not on the basis of, um, uh, I don't want to gain weight or health or some other, from the point of view of the chefs and restaurant owners, extraneous consideration. And one last question, uh, is there anything to the idea, this is from Deborah Steppel, is there anything to the idea that women have a more evolved sense of smell so that that should enhance their ability to cook? Uh, I tend to think not, but I'm not a scientist. So precisely because of that, I tend not to like um, explanations based on biology. Mm -hmm. um, because there are societies in which men cook more than in ours. Uh, uh, at various times, women are credited with, um, you know, a greater sense of taste for like the protection of their children, uh, for trying out food and figuring out if it's uh, healthful or not. Maybe that was true at one time, but uh, again, just because something has a kind of biological background, um, 
Uh, I, I don't think so. But uh, the confidence that these not only male but female food writers of the early 20th century had that women actually don't care very much about food, that that's not something that they really live for, uh, and that men not only have a, a greater appetite but more discernment. Uh, obviously, this is false, um, but it wasn't obvious for a long time. And uh, you know, again, there are stereotypes that perpetuate. I mentioned this in the 10 Restaurants book, but I'll just leave with uh, uh, two uh, Nora Ephron screenplays. One is from When Harry Met Sally, and not the famous uh, restaurant scene, but the one where he tells her, uh, you know, um, uh, sauce on the side is very big with you. He imitates uh, uh, her ordering. Uh, you know, I'll have the salmon, but uh, I, 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 don't, I, I want the sauce on the side and the salad, you know, he's very fussy about it and it can't be too sensual. On the other hand, just a few years later, Sleepless in Seattle features a scene in which the guy is going to date again and his buddies at the bar are telling him, it's a different world out there since you first dated. You know, remember, his, his wife has died and his, his kid is trying to get him back into um, uh, thinking about love. And his buddies say, it's, it's a different, like for example, do you even know what tiramisu is? And of course he doesn't. <laughs> but the, the message is that this is what women like. And if you're gonna date, you're gonna have to learn some, a whole new food language. So, uh, uh, you know, that, those are not all that recent either. Uh, but um, this this world is changing, but it hasn't it hasn't been transformed, and, and maybe uh, a, a result of our uh, discussion will be um, you know sort of noticing what different people uh, are preferring and ordering. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're going to stop there. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you uh, for sharing your lunch hour with us. We hope that you found this hour with Professor Friedman enjoyable. I would like to thank Professor Friedman most especially for generously sharing his time and knowledge with us today. Well, I'd I also thank you. And oh, you know, sure. either, either I hope you enjoyed your lunch while we were on <laughs> or have a nice lunch now. Hopefully it was a good lunch, right? Oh, oh, one hopes, yeah. <laughs> sure. and. Um, let me uh, just thank a few more people. I'd like to thank Pasquale Sicarella of the Department of History for his assistance today, uh, Stephanie Double and Henry Kwan of the Yale Alumni Association. And I'd also like to thank Arthur Greenwald for his advice to us on production. Uh, this webinar was brought to you by the Yale Food and Beverage Group, Yale Women, and the shared interest groups at the Yale Alumni Association. The Yale Food and Beverage Group is a global Facebook group of over five, uh, nearly 500 Yale alumni, students, and affiliates, and it focuses on the enjoyment of food and beverages and enthusiastically supports Yaleys in the food and beverage industries. You can look for us on Facebook at Yale Food and Beverage Group. Um, and Yale Women is a vibrant community of alums committed to advancing women's voices and perspectives and to enriching and inspiring one another, Yale, and the world. For more information, you can go to YaleWomen.org or on uh, Yale Women All is One Word on Facebook. And finally, um, you can look up uh, to find out more information on the over 100 shared interest groups within the Yale Alumni Association. You can go to www.alumni.yale.edu and search for shared interest groups. Uh, there will be a recording of this webinar in your email within the next few days. And uh, once again, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. And Professor Friedman, it was such a pleasure. Just so fascinating. I, could, I, I wish I were a student again so I could come to one of your classes. But the pleasure you. was mine. Thank you so much, Wendy. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Awesome. Okay.